On the heel, use your heel. Hi. I, I love him. I love you too, honey. Do you want us not to get married? Not to live together? We could hold hands with each other. People with intellectual disabilities are often not being allowed to express themselves sexually. That's a violation of their rights. This is me when I was one years old. I was a happy little baby. <laughs> no hair. I was bald then. <laughs> when Paul was born, we both didn't have a lot of experience in the developmental milestone. And I noticed that Paul was kind of slow in talking. Hey. We made an appointment with a developmental specialist and she evaluated him for one session for like an hour and yeah. she said, well, I can tell you right now, he's mentally retarded. He's retarded. <laughs> That's what she said, just, you know, as plain as that. Very good. The whole family was, you know, was pretty devastated from that point. I knew from an early point on that there was a lot going on in Hava's head. But she did not have the ability to communicate it. And so academically, she's preschool. However, socially, she is pretty much on an age level. I received a call one day from, uh, from Hava's mom, from Bonnie Samuels, and she said, hi, you know, my daughter and your son go to program together and we're going to a dinner dance for our bicycle club and Hava would like to invite Paul as her date. Does he have a sports jacket? <laughs> and then they just went from there. I thought, well, this will be nice. You know, he'll have a little girlfriend and somebody to do things with on, you know, the holidays or whatever, and, and not really thinking that it was going to turn into a lifelong relationship, but they were serious about each other. Honey, I want to, I want to still, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. I, I love you. You have a wife? Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I had tears of happiness seeing Hava walking down, walking down the aisle with her mother and with her father. She was so beautiful in her wedding dress, so beautiful. And I couldn't wait to take the veil off and kiss her. It was a magical day. After they were married, they lived in separate group homes which was a terrible challenge. No, no, Abby. We were not happy not living together. I was sad, cool. I was crying in my eyes and lonely. Both group homes were very much against having a married couple in their group home. They say here that um, married couples who experience developmental disabilities generally live on their own, in their own home, being capable of independent employment and financial independence, not to mention the capacity to independently coexist. So this is a way of their saying that Paul and Hava 
just aren't smart enough to be able to be married and live together. They would spend, so would spend usually a weekend at one parent's house or the other uh, so they could be together all day and all night. And then we'd take them home Sunday night and Paul would always say, I'm so sad, Dad, I'm very sad. It became very common for us to tell Haver and Paul, we're working on it, we're working on it. It took a long time. They said we were working on it. Yeah. A pair of Long Island newlyweds fighting to be together. The new husband and wife both live with mental disabilities, and they say the group home where they live won't let them live together. Well, now they are challenging those rules in a lawsuit that could change the shape of these cases going forward. Long Island reporter Kristen Thorne. Marriage is a civil right, and they are mandated to uphold everyone's civil right. They had to find a way that would be what would seem to be legitimate. And really the only thing they could come up with was their inability to give consent to sexual activity. Many group homes are hesitant to address the issue of sexuality because of the liability. There's the fear. What's going to happen? People with intellectual disabilities are most vulnerable when it comes to sexual abuse. Maybe they'll have a child. And what if they do? We can provide supports that can help them to raise that child. Some group homes will avoid the issue. So instead of dealing with it and going through all the, the, what it takes, then it's better to just not deal with it, but then you're violating their rights. Paul and Hava were recommended to YI and they came to YI. We provide services that helps people with intellectual disabilities to realize their sexuality all throughout life. So it includes an identity, it includes puberty, it includes sexual consent, sexual activity, marriage. Our job is to find out how we can help this person to become consenting, to ensure that sexual rights are not being violated. Exactly. Today we're gonna talk about consent, what it is, how important it is for you to talk about what you do. If you don't like something, you should be saying that you don't like it. It's okay not to like to be hugged. Yes, it is. You don't have to be ashamed about it. Absolutely right. Did you guys hear what Rachel said? So we're going to look at a scenario, and then I'm going to ask you guys what you think. What are you doing? Oh, I wanted to touch you a little because I wanted to have sex with you. I'm not in the mood tonight. Okay, is it okay for her to tell her boo that she's not in the mood right now? Yes, yes, yes. it is. Yes. She has every right to say, no, I don't want to be touched right now. Yes. All right, ready? People yes. thought that if you have an intellectual disability, it automatically meant that you were not consenting. That's not the case. We have since learned, and there have been court cases, that people with intellectual disabilities can give consent. In New York State, you need to prove that you are able to give consent. This is what the actual tool looks like. So what the tool is assessing for is the person's awareness of the nature of the sexual act. The person's understanding that certain sexual activities are against the law. The person's understanding of how to prevent unwanted pregnancy, using a condom, and also STIs. And then the person's understanding at being at risk in a potentially harmful, abusive, or exploitive sexual situation. Recognizing when someone is trying to take advantage of them and knowing what to do. We're assessing to see the knowledge that you have. 
And if they don't have the knowledge, then we want to know so we can provide the education. And Paul and Hav are a great example. They received sexuality education and were found to be consenting. OPWDD, which is the state agency, decided that they would help us by putting out uh, an alert to see is anyone willing to house a married couple. East End Disabilities, who had an empty apartment, said, well, we'll give, you know, a married couple a try. Me and how does that live in here now? Yeah, better. My base. Fifteen. Fifteen. Yeah. That staff is very nice. And help us with dinner. Dinner. Do our laundry. Do our clothes. clothes. Help us with our meds. Uh, people nice to me. Yes. As happy now. We we have it. Me and Hava are very happy that we're living together. together. I usually will get notices about people with intellectual disabilities being married but invariably those couples all are higher functioning than Paul and Hava in that they're able to live independently. They're not dependent upon a group home to assist them with, with some daily tasks of living, so it is different. I think it's important that people know that if you're married with an intellectual disability, you're not necessarily someone that can live on their own, but you can still have a loving relationship. It's important to let every individual, whether it's somebody who is hard of hearing, somebody who is blind, allow to grow as much as they possibly can, to become as independent as they can. I think that's what life is. I think that's what we're here for.